Good morning and welcome to the live stream of the Jericho Congregational Church. Uh, we're glad you could join us this morning to worship and praise the living God and to receive his word as a congregation. I have uh, one brief announcement I'd like to share with you. Um, last week, Pastor Dave mentioned that plans are in place for uh, an outdoor service at Arnold and Paula Baisley's house in Richmond, uh, which is uh, taking place next week, Sunday, July 19th. Um, in order to appropriately accommodate people and reduce our numbers, we're going to be holding two services, one at 8.30 a.m., and one at 10.30 a.m., and uh, attendance at those services will be capped at, uh, at about 40 people. Um, for those who are unable to join us in person, we are working on uh, making the live stream available or pre-recorded service. Uh, details will be forthcoming on that front. Um, and also, an email will be sent out this afternoon uh, with additional details about how to appropriately gather and how to sign up uh, for this service. So we look forward to, to seeing you there. I'd like to pray for us this morning as we um, enter into worship together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come and gather as your people this morning. Lord, we pray that your name would be magnified, that your name would be praised through our worship, through our prayers, and through the receiving of your word this morning. You are a great God. May we turn our hearts toward you, and may you soften us this day as we come before you. Amen. Hear now the call to worship from Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 24 to 28. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You will live in the land I give your forefathers. You will be my people, and I will be your God. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. <laughs> it's great to be back in the sanctuary here and uh, meeting with you all. Um, our first song is, is Blessed Be Your Name. Blessed Be Your Name. And uh, this is a song by Beth and Matt Redman. Let's worship the Lord together. Be your name in the that is plentiful, streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Oh, I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing pour out, turn back to pray. In the darkness closes in, Lord, still I our fortress. God is our refuge and strength from Psalm 46. He says, God is our refuge and a strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. That's the church. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. So let's continue our praise with the, the song from Psalm 46. Uh, it may not be totally familiar to you, but you'll catch on. Exalted among the 
nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Let's sing it again. See striving and know that I am God. See striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be Thank you, Frank and Carol. Well, we have an opportunity to continue our worship this morning with our time of praise and adoration by joining together in a time of confession and petition. And I will leave space uh, during our time of confession uh, for you to silently confess your sins before God. Let's pray. Father, we come before you humbled by your awesome and holy presence. And may we cease striving, for you are our stronghold. Lord, we are in awe of the mystery of your grace throughout time and history, your constant presence and revelation through the ages and your revelation to us through your word and in this place and in this time. Lord, we are but a breath and you sustain us. And we thank you, Lord, for the gifts of your grace that you give to your church, to each one in this body. And that through your spirit, you have established your church here to be a light to the nations. And yet, Lord, we confess that we sometimes dismiss the nudges of your spirit and choose instead to listen to the world or become a servant to our own interests. Lord, we confess that we fail to pursue the construction of your kingdom at times and instead continue constructing our own. And we fail to truly listen and bear with one another in love, our own brothers and sisters. And Lord, we confess that at times we are more interested in what you can give us rather than just sitting at your feet and in awe of your presence. Lord, help us now to put to death, to make war on the sin that we struggle with uh, on a daily basis. Lord, because we know that when we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we confess our sin before you now. Lord, we rest in the truth of your word 
in Colossians chapter 3 that we have died and our lives are now hidden with you, with Christ in you. Bear in us, Lord, the fruit of your Spirit. Continue this work. Uh, Do what it takes to grow in us love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Lord, we lift before you our prayers. We take time this morning to lift up those children and families that have um, begun SBC this week. What a joy. Um, We pray for the parents uh, and those who are running uh, neighborhood groups as they guide their children. We pray that you would give them wisdom. We pray for the children as they uh, receive your word and um, learn more about you. May they grow in you and in their knowledge of you and in their love for you. And we do lift up the Bible camp team as they continue to prepare uh, in the weeks ahead. We ask that you would be with them as they prepare lessons and activities. And Lord, we pray now as your church, as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite our kids forward for the children's sermon. Come on up, and you can leave your masks on during this time. It's good to see you guys. Thanks for coming up. Well, summer Bible camp has started this week. And I'm hoping that you guys had a chance to participate in some of Summer Bible Camp this week. Can you tell me what's something you did or what's something you learned this week? Does anybody have something they'd like to share? Karis, what's something that you learned or did this week, Summer Bible Camp? I built um, the treasure box. Yeah, we built treasure boxes. Was there something that you, you guys, JJ or Nora, did this week or learned about? Did you watch a video? Do you remember what the video was about? Battle of Jericho? Yeah, Joshua and the Battle of Jericho. Yeah, very good. And I would encourage you at home, for all you big kids at home, you can check out the Summer Bible Camp resources, and I think it will be a blessing to you as well. Henry, did you have something you wanted to share? Um, I made, like, I made um, a treasure box, and I'm putting things in it. Yeah, yeah. We made treasure boxes at home. Well, the theme for SBC this year is the attributes of God, and I was thinking this week, Attributes is a pretty big word. Does anybody know what the word attributes means? Attributes? We have this book that was given out called The Attributes of God. Does anybody know what that word means? I struggled with that a little bit this week. I I had a hard time. How do I describe what attributes are? And I thought, well, characteristics, but that's a big word too. Or qualities, that's also a big word. But attributes are, it's a way of describing what something is like, what something or someone is like. So, if you're, you're looking at me now, so what, how would you describe me? Well, like, what color hair do I have? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Black. Yeah, dark hair. I've got dark hair. What else? What else do you notice about me? 
glasses. Yeah, I, I wear glasses. Okay, what else? Um, uh, a bell. A, a bell? I don't have any bells on, but good guess. Oh, a belt. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. It was hard to hear with the mask on. Yes, I am wearing a belt. Yep. Good. So we can, we, we often, we can talk about our physical appearance in terms of attributes. Another thing I have is I have freckles on my face. That's another attribute that I have or something, it's a way of describing that I'm like. But we can also talk about someone's personality. Like we can say, oh, Henry is pretty energetic. Or we can say that Karis is sometimes pretty silly. And that's also an attribute. Or we can describe somebody's character. We could say things like, Nora is pretty compassionate. She's a compassionate person. Or we could say, JJ is, is really thoughtful at times. And, and so that's also ways that we can describe what someone is like. So attributes, there are many different ways to describe what you are like and what I am like. And there's also many ways to describe what God is like. How would you describe what God is like? Anybody want to describe? What is God like? Important. Yeah, he's important. Big. He's big. Very good. What else? What else is God like? He's kind. He's kind. Yeah, and maybe you kids at home too can think of some ways. What, what is God like? How would you describe God? He's unchanging. He's all-powerful. And one thing that SBC, one attribute for this week is that we're learning how God is present everywhere, and I am never alone. And there's a verse that you guys know from Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, that says, have I not commanded you? Do you guys know this verse? How does it go? Can everybody say it? Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Do not be. Do not be. Dismayed. For. Lord your God is with you. For the Lord your God is with you, will be with you wherever you go. There's another verse that I want to share with you this morning from Psalm 139. Do you guys know what Psalm 139 says? Psalm 139 says, God is with me when I sit down and when I stand up. And God is with me when I go out and when I come back. God is with me even if I go up in the sky. He's with me. He's there. And God is there even if I go underground. And then he asks, is there anywhere that I can go where God isn't? To hell. Okay, we could have separation from, from God there, yep. Yeah. But is there anywhere I can go from, from where God is? God is everywhere. And he is always with me. Yeah. And so he also says, if I go up to the highest place and I look out on the horizon and I look as far as I can see, he's still there. He's still with me. And if I if I go there, he would find me in a second. And he's even with me, the psalmist says, he's even with me in the dark. Sometimes, are, are you guys afraid in the dark? <laughs> Sometimes. And, and God, God is even with us there. He even sees me in the dark. So we have a great big God that we serve. And let's give thanks to him that God is present everywhere, and I am never alone. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, we thank you uh, that you are with us, that you commanded, um, that you encouraged Joshua, um, that you are with him wherever he goes, and you are with us wherever we go. I pray that uh, this truth we would hide in our hearts 
and know um, that you are near. And we pray this in your name. Amen. All right, you guys can go back to your seat. This morning we have the opportunity to receive the word from um, Acts chapter 11, and, um, and Brian Ham will be uh, preaching for us. So thank you, Brian, for your willingness to, um, to bring the word this morning, and I will turn it over to him. Well, thank you. Good morning. It is good to be with everybody uh, here, both in person and uh, virtually as well. I do have a few confessions to make before I get started. First, uh, for those of you who might have been wondering if Pastor Dave just let himself go, uh, nope, no, I am Brian Ham. I am a member here at the church uh, and happy to fill in uh, while he is away, having some much-deserved vacation time. Uh, but the second confession, I'm a teacher. I teach at Mount Mansfield Junior High School, and I just have to get this off of my chest that probably since March 18th, when schools were shut down for COVID, this is the first time I've put on a pair of pants. Um, so I just had to get that out of the way so that we could have zero obstacles between you and me this morning. Join me in your Bibles, if you would, in Acts chapter 11. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 18 together. The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance, I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it, and I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. Then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, God has granted us, granted even the Gentiles, repentance unto life. Let me pray for us this morning. God, we are thankful for your word We are thankful for what it is that you would like to teach us. Would your spirit open our hearts to receive? And Father, would all that I have prepared be made glory to you and not to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, since its release back in 2015, I've heard lots of incredible things about the Broadway production of Hamilton. Critics were blown away, the Twitterverse exploded with its praises, and even a few of my friends have had the opportunity to watch it live and have raved about its storytelling, about the music, and about the power of its performances. And since the COVID-19 outbreak has happened, all live performances have been ceased, of course, right? Everything across our country shut down. But last week, the producers of Hamilton partnered with Disney Plus and they released a filmed version of a 2016 performance 
that was performed by almost the entire original cast in the Richard Rogers Theater on Broadway. And Katie and I did not throw away our shot to watch the film. Now, of course, Lost is the immersion of being in the theater and really feeling the music and feeling the performances, but it was an incredibly well-done production. If you are members of Disney+, Plus, I would strongly encourage you take a look. But as we were watching this production, one theme struck me over and over and over again. Now, Growing up, I learned a little bit about Alexander Hamilton in school, but I did not know the full extent of his story. Nor did I really know much about Aaron Burr outside of a Got Milk ad from the 1990s. But Alexander Hamilton defied many odds to reach the places that he reached. And Aaron Burr also went through quite an ordeal to reach the status that they reached. And yet both of them were overwhelmed at times with fear of controlling the narrative for their legacy. How would they be remembered? What would people say about them? And I wonder if that's something that we can relate to. How often do we worry about how we are perceived? How often are we consumed by thoughts of, gosh, what do they think about what I'm going to do? What I'm going to say? Who I'm going to support? And I know that that's how Peter was feeling walking into Acts 11. Two weeks ago, Pastor Dave taught us about the conversion of Saul. And the thing I took away was that the desire for control and power corrupts mission. That God's grace arrests our personal missions. That it initiates us into his mission and brings reconciliation. And then last week, that reconciliation came to fruition through Peter's encounter with Cornelius. And we were left with this question, are we prepared for those that God is welcoming through conversion? Well, this week, we find ourselves with a very familiar sounding text, right? Doesn't the start of chapter 11 sound eerily similar to something we've heard before? Well, of course, Luke is sharing the same exact story of Peter that we just heard last week in chapter 10. Why is Brian Ham coming out of the bullpen for Pastor Dave and just teaching the exact same story? Do we really need this? Well, my hope for us this morning is that we can walk away from this repeated teaching, understanding that mission requires us to surrender our narratives, that mission invites us to tell and to retell God's narrative, and that mission advances when the lasting legacy belongs to God. To start here, though, let's look back at verse number one. News has spread quickly, right? Somebody from Caesarea must have shared about what happened at Cornelius' home on Facebook, and before Peter's even able to arrive, the comment section has exploded. People are forming their accusations and they've filled in all the pieces of the story. They know what's happened and they are ready to pounce on Peter. And yet, it's fascinating to me, Dr. Ben Witherington, in his commentary on Acts, he points out that the language Luke uses here, right, it directly parallels language that was used back in Acts chapter 8, right? Pastor Dave talked about this a few weeks ago. Between Philip's ministry with Simon the sorcerer in Samaria and just before he encountered the Ethiopian eunuch, right, verse eight, or excuse me, chapter eight, verse fourteen reads, When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. Well, let's look back then at verse one again here in eleven. Right? Verse one in eleven simply says Oops, lost my place here. The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So not only had they heard about this in chapter 8, and they sent Peter to take care of it, 
Now, in, verse, or in chapter 11, verse 1, they found it's not just the Samaritans who are being welcomed in, but now the Gentiles too, and Peter is a part of it? I thought we sent you to take care of the problem, Pete. Well, as it was alluded to last week, the church was not prepared for, con- for the, these conversions to include the Samaritans nor the Gentiles either. Continuing on in verse 2 and 3, Peter is met by the circumcised believers with a criticism. You went into their house and ate with them? Withering points out here that Luke is trying to show us that this is a group within the Jewish Christian church that clings tightly to conservative Torah practices. It's not the same group of believers that Peter gathered with him in Joppa to travel first to Caesarea and then on to Jerusalem, though the same Greek word is used in describing circumcised believers in both places. These travelers are important to Peter's story, but we'll discuss them in a little bit. The circumcised believers here in Acts 11 verse 2 are not people that we would classify as bad people if they were in our midst. Contemporarily, they would probably serve here as deacons or deaconesses. They'd chair our church committees. They'd attend the advisory board and annual meetings. And they would certainly dress nicely, and they would sit in their generationally assigned seats if they were here in our sanctuary and not live streaming this morning. Yet these folks, when they find out that Peter is on his way back to town, they run out to meet him, not to celebrate what the Holy Spirit has done with these new Gentile believers, but to accuse him of defiling himself by eating with them in their homes. Remember back to last week in Acts chapter 10, 28, right? He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. See, Peter knew right when he walked into Cornelius' house what he was getting himself into. He knew that this act would directly impact his legacy. This decision would certainly reflect on how he would be perceived, how he would be remembered. And it seems as though he anticipated running into this obstacle here in Acts 11. Yet hear the rest of verse 28 and 29. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. You see, mission requires for our narratives to be surrendered. In many ways, too, this passage also parallels what God is doing in Acts chapter 9 with Saul's life on the road to Damascus. Where Saul's personal mission to end the Christian church needed to be arrested in order for him to be sent on God's way. I wonder, too, even in our church, if there are places where we have lost focus of what's most important. If there are narratives that we cling to control of that need surrendering. You see, Peter knows what he's getting himself into, and he knows that he's going to meet resistance from his own congregation upon arriving back in Jerusalem. But he still chooses to surrender that control and go where God is asking him to go. This portion of the church in Jerusalem had clearly reverted back to elevating at least some of the practices of the Torah. Pastor Kuhn's alluded to this last week. There was great emphasis placed on circumcision as a rite of passage for conversion, as well as clear objections to dining and being with those who were non-Jews, most likely due to unclean food practices. Right? They were good at keeping rules. And I wonder if those rules were kept in place to try to hedge them, to protect them, to keep them away from sin. And yet over time, just as those hedges for the Torah did for the Pharisees became more important, 
than the law itself. I believe that in our midst, there exist opinions and beliefs and politics and expectations, both in me and in our church, that we hold on to so that we can keep control, so that we can hang on to the narrative. After all, being a good Christian just means going to church and reading your Bible and praying some, right? Just being kind enough, trying to be a good person, maybe tithing some, giving of your time, right? These are the words I hear in testimonies all the time that this appeared to be the legacy of being a Christian. And I wonder if these exist because control is comfortable, It's comfortable not to step outside of that lane. It's comfortable to not be challenged or stretched or have to go outside of where we've always been. I hear all the time, right? This is a free country. Our time is our own. We can do what we want. That's what freedom is, isn't it? I don't think that's the case. Peter could very easily have stayed with Simon the Tanner. He was not looking to go and save Gentiles. But God spoke to him, and Peter surrendered the control of his own narrative. He left what was comfortable, and he went where God directed. Once we finally come to a place where we can surrender our narrative, mission invites us to tell God's story. As I mentioned earlier, Luke's already given us this passage of scripture back in chapter 10. And yet in verse 4, Peter begins recounting the events of all that has happened. His personal witness to what's transpired. He retells the story of being in Joppa and praying. And while doing so, slipping into a trance, he sees the blanket of bacon coming out of the sky. And he recounts his arguing with the spirit, the men who came to see him, and his trip to see Cornelius. Now, Peter here, at least as Luke records in chapter 11, does omit retelling the sermon that he gave at Cornelius' home. Maybe some of you wish I had omitted telling the sermon today. But it's fascinating that Luke records all of these events a second time here in chapter 11. Now, to us, this may not seem like that big of a deal, right? We're kind of used to seeing the Bible have places where it repeats itself. But let's remember, all Luke had to work with back in the first century was parchment and quill. This was no Google Doc word word processing device with a terabyte of cloud space to work with, right? He had a limited amount of resources, and they were expensive. And yet Luke intentionally details almost the entire story a second time. Why? I think it's because God knows that we need reminders. As a parent of young children, I know all too well how many times they need to be reminded that their hands do not belong on one another, that the floor is not a hamper, Their clothing is not a napkin. Okay, I'm going off track. God knows that as his children, we need to hear things a few times before we get it. I, too, need those reminders. Just because I've watched my son intentionally walk into the path of his sister for the 40th time today, I don't need to lose my mind and scream. You see, throughout Scripture, whether it's God repeating someone's name, Jesus repeating miracles, God bringing back story after story, God is using reminders to get our attention. It's no wonder that the early Jews gravitated towards God's gift of the Shema in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you are to be on your hearts. 
Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. I know that if I talked about the same thing every time I sat down and every time I got, got up and every time I went for a walk and I had things tied on my hands and stuck to my forehead, I would probably be better at remembering. And that's what God is telling us. These are the kinds of reminders that we need to tell his story. And so here in Acts 11... Luke tells the exact same story a second time because God wants the church to know without a shadow of a doubt that his kingdom is not just for the Jews, but it is for all. God's church is not a country club. It's a community center. And you remember the circumcised Jews that I mentioned earlier that were traveling with Peter? Well, as Peter recounts these events, he alludes to their eyewitnesses, right? He calls out his six brothers who are with him in verse 12. And drawing back to this idea that both times, both when they're introduced in Acts 10 and when the the group in Acts 11.1 are mentioned, that the same Greek word for the circumcised believers is used in both places. These are like-minded brothers. And I think it's intentional that Peter has them with him to bring testimony of God's story. I don't want to spoil the end of Hamilton for those who haven't seen it, so I'll try to tread lightly here. But in the final scene... Hamilton kind of comes to this realization that he's not in control of his legacy anymore. And there's a really moving song and a cool montage that kind of accompanies this realization. And I think that that's a realization that we need to come to now. We don't need to wait until the end of our lives to come to the realization that we're not in control of our legacy You're not in control. I'm not in control. And as much as we desire control over our choices and over our lives, over our story and who people are going to say we're going to be, we are not. Now, of course, not every picture is perfect. Where Hamilton remains in the secular, of course, is that the emphasis is placed on other people to tell the story. But what's beautiful about what Peter does here in Acts 11 is he gives us a bigger vision of what that can be. Peter helps us to understand that mission succeeds when it's God's legacy that remains. In verses 15 and 16, Peter draws a connection for these Jewish Christians that really struck me as I was preparing You see, Peter chooses to repeat the words that Jesus shared while dining together with the apostles in the event shortly after his resurrection that's recorded in Acts chapter 1. Right, Just before Jesus ascends, he gathers them together in Acts 1, and he shares with them that John baptized with water, but you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. And this invitation that Jesus gives them ultimately leads to the launching of the church at Pentecost. And what I found so fascinating is that this is the exact same language that Peter used also for a dinner. But not a dinner in the upper room with Jesus, but a dinner with Gentiles. Peter juxtaposes the commissioning of the apostles with his dinner at Cornelius, to drive home God's point. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. 
Peter concludes his defense with a question for his critics, and I think it is a poignant one for us as well. In verse 17, it says, So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? And we're told in verse 18, that when they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. See, Peter takes their critique and he recounts God's story for them. And he shapes their understanding of his actions, his choices, and shows them that he is simply acting in accordance with God's narrative. See, there's an emptiness to the legacy that people leave behind. People are flawed. People are imperfect. They make mistakes. They're selfish. But God is none of those things. We just heard it from the children. To live into God's mission, we first need to be willing to surrender control of our own narratives. Right? Peter could have stayed. Peter could have done the comfortable thing. But he gave up comfort to follow the king. We have to be willing to give up that desire for control. Secondly, we have to be willing to tell God's story, not just once, but we need to tell and retell the story and to remind just, not just ourselves, but to remind our fellow believers of all that God has done, all that God is doing, and all that God will do. But we have to do this acknowledging that the legacy that lasts must be God's. We cannot be concerned with how we will be remembered or what lasting impact I might have on this world. It must be the legacy of Jesus Christ, crucified, raised, and reigning that endures. Let me pray for us this morning. Lord, we ask that your spirit would speak truth into our hearts. That you would help us to combat those lies of control. Help us come to a place of surrender. Lord, give us opportunities and reminders to continue to tell your story. And Father, may all of it be for your glory and yours alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Receive this.
benediction as a reminder of whose legacy is being written. And now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.